joining the inaugural From Paws to Claws Visionary 2020 series. Your Office of Alumni Relations is thankful for your attendance as we continuously provide opportunities for our community to stay connected. This is our third seminar in the series during the month of June. Our first, semin our first seminar was highly interactive. We talked about the many roles as we find ourselves in because we're juggling right now during this period of time. Also, last week, we discussed that it's not the time to give up on your career goals or ignore your interests just because of the pandemic that we are in. 2020 is about clarifying your purpose that can propel you to your new internship, job search, while staying true to yourself. Each webinar has had highly knowledgeable alumni leading the way. Before we begin our interaction today, here is a tad bit of history on From Paws to Claws. The Alumni Student Networking event was originally designed in 2008 when Kareem Taylor, class of 2010 in his sophomore year, expressed that students should know the great things alumni are doing. Keep in mind that From Paws to Claws is also the signature event of your Office of Alumni Relations. We call on a, the alumni community to embrace our alumni in waiting, commonly known as students. We encircle them until they become a member of the only permanent constituency of our alma mater. As cubs, they bounce, they pounce, finding their way, developing developing academically, spiritually, as they become who they are, just like who we are, as we give our service nationally and, go, and globally while we're remembering to provide financial support to the institution that develop and place them on their path as well-rounded citizens. There is more to the program and feel free to read the entire historical review in the alumni section on the CAU website. Again, we wish to dedicate our newest edition to the Perfect Vision class of 2020. As an alumni community, we did not have the opportunity to interact with them as our newest alumni group because of the double pandemic. So, before we begin our conversation, I would like to express many thanks to my colleague, Chastity B. Evans, class of 2010, who serves as the program manager in the Office of Alumni Relations. She will be your host for this series was one that she created. Chastity, please move us forward in today's interaction. Thank you so much, alumna Galen E. Gatewood Joshua for the beautiful introduction and greetings. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining your Office of Alumni Relations for the Vision 2020 series, Schedule the Big Rocks, Don't Sort Gravel webinar. I would also like to provide a special thank you to alumna Dr. Michelle Rhodes, Program Specialist for the Office of Online Learning and Continuing Education for being the technical specialist of this webinar. We're going to slide on down to the purpose for, the, uh, for this evening, well, for this afternoon. We have some powerhouses on the panel today to expound on the never-ending pings, dings, and rings, and how easy it is to become overwhelmed by our many distractions, even if you know what to focus on. The purpose of this webinar is to identify what is important. In this webinar, we will discuss strategies, for identifying the few big rocks, the most important priorities, i.e. job interviews, and how to prevent the gravel, which is the less important things, 
i.e. bedazzling, from distracting you. We'll talk specifically about your technology and how important it is to align your relationship with technology to priorities that matter most. The virtual session is bound to motivate, empower, and arm you with tangible tools and tips to clarify which career path you will love. This engaging conversation will guide you through interest-based reflections and a proven career exploration process to support your new internship or job search while staying true to yourself. Just a few housekeeping rules before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. I will bring up the questions during our Q&A section to discuss. So please type those into the Q&A panel and we will bring them up after everyone has um, had shared their interests during the Q&A section. Now, without further ado, we're gonna introduce our first panel for this afternoon, alumnus Mark Fields. Excuse me, hold on one second. So, alumnus Mark Fields is a proud Panther who graduated in 2000 from Clark Atlanta University, where he obtained a degree in business administration with a concentration in marketing. He is currently the VP of undergraduate and graduate schools for Clark Atlanta University National Alumni Association. Alumnus Fields currently works for the Atlanta Community Food Bank as the retail sourcing supervisor. Prior to his current position, he served 14 years in the United States Navy, where he recruited men and women for the last 10 years of his career. He was selected Recruiter of the Year in 2008 and 2009, along with numerous other awards before moving into a leadership and training position in the recruiting department. Alumnus Fields is married to Chandra Fields. They have two children and one granddaughter. He is the owner and operator of a hair care product company, Vision 2000 Products, and a custom apparel business known as Be Unique Marketing. Alumnus Fields is a proud member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated and a charter member of Impact Church UMC, where he serves in many capacities. Thank you so much, Alumnus Fields, for taking the time to serve on this panel and serve your alma mater. Thank you, Ms. Evans. I would like to thank everyone for, jo for joining the inaugural alumni series, speaker series. I'm pleased to be part of such an event with such esteemed alums. Thank you, thank you so much. Now going down to your first question, Alumnus Fields, glancing down the road five to 10 years from now, how do you visualize or see technology evolving? And how will hands-on positions and careers expand? Well, technological advances are ever-changing. Uh, since the invention of smartphones, technology has blossomed with the creations of apps, mobile banking, et cetera. And because of, and because of COVID-19, individuals are forced to use technology platforms such as Ring Central, Zoom, Google Meet, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, diversity, uh, with, diversity with Black Lives Matter uh, it has been a perfect storm during this time, during COVID. As you will see as we go through, this, through the uh, PowerPoint that I presented, that I will present, you will see more tech startup companies and existing tech, comp tech companies hire minorities and women. So the second part of your question was about how will the hands-on careers be impacted or evolve? Yes. As you can see, there, 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 there are always going to be jobs that hands-on careers that you can't get away from. We can, we can improve technology to help them, but they're always going to have to be healthcare professionals, nurses, doctors, uh, veterinarians. That's going to have to provide that customer service and give that personal touch mm -hmm. and use their hands to do surgery. Even though some surgeries are used by robots, the doctors actually have to guide that robot to get to the precise area where they're trying to get to. Skilled laborers, 
technology and law enforcement. And I see in a future where um, skilled trade schools will start to evolve as one of those landing spots. Some kids may not decide to go to college. Uh, they may decide to, to go to a trade school because of some of the values that they do offer. Design, media arts, and the beauty industry and culinary services. As you know, when you go to a restaurant, a robot can't fix your food, your, your favorite food. So you're definitely going to need a, a, an individual who can prepare your food the way you want it. And talking about the beauty industry, as Ms. Evans uh, discussed earlier, that's, I've, been in, I've had, had my own hair product company for 27 years now. And that's one of the, that's one of the last industries that have that's kind of fallen in line with technology. Uh, they've always been one of those industries that hasn't been on the uh, edge of technology. But since the inception of Cash App, uh, electronic um, appointment bookings, stylists and barbers and nail estheticians, they're all starting to, to use that technology to uh, streamline some of their services. Next slide, please. As we talked about earlier, uh, Black and Latino workers are, are, are startlingly absent from most of top technology companies. The, ma the major tech firms from the highest pro proportion of Black workers is Amazon, which is 15%. And I dug a little deeper with when I looked at that 15%. Out of that 15%, about 70% of that are workers that work in a warehouse. So we're not, a, we're actually the frontline employees of Amazon. So they are making some strides to hire uh, minorities or black workers, but we're, we're not in the boardrooms, we're not in the management positions as we would like to be. Uh, most, of, most others are in the low single digits. Latinos are most present at uh, Hewlett Packard, where they make up 14% of the workforce. Uh, but they are definitely hopeful signs. Intel, uh, Intel recently went public with its diversity figures. And as you can see, they're gonna make, they're gonna make a strides in 2020. And when I talked about the perfect storm earlier, that was one of the things that I talked about because with all, all you see a lot of companies are changing. Uh, some of they, they're asking, they're starting to do diversity inclusion programs, even at the Atlanta Community Food Bank, even though we're, we're actually going through the process of hiring a diversity inclusion individual because our CEO didn't realize what type of uh, environment that he had at our location. So I'm sure a lot of CEOs are trying to do those types of things. So I should see, so hopefully we should start seeing an uptick in the end of 2020 going into 2021 where individuals are being hired based on their skill sets um, and not just their color. Yeah. Well, do you by any chance see any um, inadvertent consequences occurring or, you know, we should be thinking about now like any potential risks or anything? Yes. Um, so with, with that with, with that point right there, uh, I'm going to read a quote from a psychologist that I, that I pulled up. According to a Stanford psychology, Kellogg McDonald, people feel not just addicted but trapped. Others insist it's not the gadget's fault. We cannot blame our phone or computer for our addictive behavior or our compulsive need to check or text or emails at, at Spotlight or at a dinner table. So who is who are to blame? And they have four of those uh, questions. And it says employers who inspect staff members to be available 24 seven. And I know we've all had to deal with that when we didn't have cell phones and we didn't access our emails to our phone. Employers, they had to wait to the next day. But we as individuals and employers feel like they have to contact us on a regular basis. They'll send an email at 10 o'clock at night. And the first thing, as soon as we hear that being, even though we should program ourselves not to answer it until the next morning, but because we want to do a good job, we answer that phone. So we constantly attach that to, the, to your device. Mm -hmm. Our emotional insecurities requiring us to see what others are doing. And we see that with Facebook and uh, Instagram. People put posts up to see how many likes they can get. And if you notice you haven't gotten a lot of likes, a lot of times people take those posts down and, and <laughs> we're always doing that. And I know that, I know that Facebook had talked about at the beginning of the year, they were going to remove that option. And I'm not sure, I haven't seen it yet, but they said they were going to do it. Yeah, Facebook and Instagram. Well, right. well, Instagram is owned by Facebook, but Correct. yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen that either. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. In our culture that makes us feel guilty for not taking any time off or away. Uh, and, I, and I think we have to make sure that we're doing that, but we have to disconnect from these devices and, 
and make sure that we're uh, taking for mental health purposes. Mm -hmm. And our human system that responds to technological with a squint of dopamine. So what's, what's important about that is we start, our bodies become addicted to reaching down for the phone. We have conversations. Uh, first thing we do is we have to be intentional about when you have dinner with your, with your partner or with a colleague to make sure that you put your phone down, leave it in the car or whatever, to spend that quality time interacting with different people. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Alumnus Fields, for the wonderful insight and information. I mean, if you have any questions for Alumnus Fields, people that are on the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now. We will be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. Thank you again, Alumnus Fields. We truly yes, appreciate yes. your, your insight. Well, introducing our next panelist for this afternoon is Alumna Kiplin Primus. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, in 2001, alumna Primus and Jazz 91.9 WCOK FM launched the local take with Kiplin Primus. This public affairs show features discussions about critical issues facing Atlanta and profiles of organizations doing important work in the communities served by WCOK. As public broadcasters, it is part of our mission to engage with the community and feature people and issues that aren't always covered by mainstream commercial media outlets. Soon to celebrate their 10th anniversary, they cover subject matters from health to finance to cultural events and politics. The local take has become a news source for our community. Journalist Alumna Primus is a graduate of Howard University with a BA in Journalism and English. Additionally, she is a graduate of Clark Atlanta University where she obtained an MBA in Marketing. She has a long career in public and commercial media including stints with the Atlanta Tribune, Global Atlanta, and the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. Alumna Primus is also a veteran facilitator for Story Corps Atlanta Studio where conversations between friends, family, and colleagues become part of the largest oral history project in the USA. She has written extensively on global and local initiatives for several publications and media outlets. Alumna Primus, thank you for being a part of this panel and for serving your alma mater today. Well, I want to thank you, Chastity, and the CAU alumni team for this wonderful program, and I am very thankful that you asked me to participate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, we're going to jump right into your first question for this afternoon. In terms of sorting through gravel to discover the big rocks, what first five goal setting steps would you take to strike gold or success? Well, I want to caution everybody that when you're sorting to gravel, you have to be just as careful as if that gravel was the gold. Mm -hmm. The main way that we discover the big rocks is by going through gravel. So you have to treat all of that gravel good because you never know, you know, when it might come back up. So when you're dealing with gravel, what you have to do is prepare research, you know, Google, go out on all those social media platforms and see exactly what's going on with that gravel. Um, now, I know some people might say, well, that's too much. You know, nobody has time for that. Why can't I just, you know, give them a call, find out what's going on. But you've got to take the time to get to know what people are thinking. You got to know where they are because you, you can't approach people if you don't know even where they are. And you got to do that research. Now, if you've got a bunch of data scientists and 10 page algorithms looking at data, you know, eventually you might be able to come, oh no, this is the exact person I want or this is the exact person I need to talk to. But for the most part, we're all out there in the world, bumping into gravel, bumping into people, <laughs> and you just never know. So my, you know, the first thing is that you've got to treat people good. 
Um, you know, the first time a friend commented on my Facebook page and was like, you're doing wonderful and great. And I was like, okay, now, you know, the only thing I share is the good stuff, you know? <laughs> so perception is almost never reality. That's another reason for doing, you know, your research. Because you got to know not only the stuff that they want you to know, but try to find some stuff that they might not want you to know, because you might have the answer to that stuff. Yeah, exactly. So that's another reason, you know, get that research done. Um, cultivate that gravel, you know what I mean? So I'm not saying do this to every piece of gravel, but you're going to bump up into some pieces of gravel, they're going to have a little bit of shine or a little bit of dust or a little bit of rust. <laughs> and the ones that you feel drawn to, there's probably a reason. And those are the ones that you want to concentrate on. But I'd say that for more than one reason is because sometimes a small piece of gravel that you have treated very well might connect you to 10 pieces of gold. So that it's an old saying, you know, treat the janitor and the president the same, because you really never know these days where, you know, that goal, you know, might rub off on you. Mm -hmm. Another thing I want to share is you should not be limited by borders. The world is getting smaller every day. And right now, if you don't have a connection in London or Ghana or Singapore or Senegal or Rio de Janeiro or Sao Paulo, Vancouver, there's something wrong. I know someone in all of those places. When my niece took a international study trip to Singapore, one of my clients, PNC Bank, she's from Singapore. She connected my niece to her sister. So don't let borders limit you. Um, what's the point of the world getting smaller if you're only concentrated in your neighborhood, in your school, in your state? The majority of the folks that you wanna work with are not in the United States because the United States is just one market. So find out about those other places. On Twitter, I follow people, I follow the Google um, VP of Kenya on Twitter. She and I had a back and forth last Sunday because she posts these wonderful, you know, Sunday reads. So if you're not connecting with people beyond the United States, if you're not finding gravel somewhere else, you're going to be limited in what you're going to be able to do and the goal that you're going to find. Mm -hmm. So now that was three things. And the other thing that I want to mention, I've been talking about research and finding information, but if you are not interested in lifelong learning, you're going to miss it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I went back to Clark Atlanta University and got my MBA when I was 40 years old. And I honestly thought, there was nothing I was going to learn. I thought this is going to just validate all the stuff I know. <laughs> it's a waste of my time, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> well, I cannot tell you how much I learned. I cannot tell you the connections I made. We ended up studying in Germany. So I've got a contact at Heidelberg University that I am still in touch with. Um, I know a guy over in Mannheim, Germany, who is at the John Deere plant. Wow. So I learned more than I ever thought I was going to learn, and I'm still learning. I just signed up for two courses on LinkedIn, because why not? Wait a um, minute. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me there's a John Deere plant in Germany? Yes, and I'm going to tell you one of the reasons that I just <laughs> recently reached back out to him is that in their plant, when John Deere took over this plant, the culture was so set on... Um, the way factories worked, it was a, a line mm -hmm. and everything is on the conveyor belt and you build it, you know, every day you're at the same spot doing the same thing. So and what this to, plant initiate, yeah, what John Deere initiated at Mannheim was on-demand manufacturing. Mm -hmm. The culture was so rigid that John Deere literally had to wait about 18 months, encourage people to retire. And once they got the people who were, you know, tied into with personal passion to that 
that line of manufacturing, they were able to implement manufacturing on demand. And the reason I reached back out to him is because of the culture in our police departments that needs to change. Yeah. And they literally had to wait for the bastions of the culture who were not going to change to get <laughs> out before they could. But yeah, so don't worry about borders. Always learn, keep learning, take courses. Um, and then the last thing is to write. Mm -hmm. um, I know students know when you write your notes, you absorb them better. You know, one of the best things I was taught in college was to take my notes in class, and then when I study, to basically write them over. Yeah. You can write your future into being. Octavia Butler, a famous African-American female writer, she wrote about the award she would win before she wrote her first book. Cassidy mentioned I'm on WCLK's radio show. I wrote that show into being. It did not exist. I wrote it out. I wrote a plan. I dropped in some research, presented it to the station in 2010 and went on the air January 2011. And as Chastity mentioned, in 2011, next year, you know, pandemic, race relations, whatever, we will be celebrating, you know, a decade on the air. But I wrote that out. And you can also write your future um, into existence. Nothing that I have done with intention hasn't been written down first. Well, so those thank are my five things. Oh my goodness. I mean, that was a lot to take in. And I'm definitely, I am going to agree with you on that one. No borders for 2020, but we could travel in 2021 though. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Network <Fingers> now. Cross. <laughs> Network now. Um, because I don't see myself going over, no. you know, not with uh, what number is the president now? 45? I don't yeah. see, I don't see 45 allowing me back into the country. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm going to just stay put. <laughs> so thank you so much, Alumna Primus, for your essential tips and for your materials. Um, if you all have any questions for Alumnus Primus, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now. We will be sure to get to, get to them um, right away once we start the Q&A session. And don't forget, you all, to check out her show on WCOK. It's awesome. She's always featuring alumni and students on there. And I watch it. And I'm, you know, I'm just, I learn new things every day when I listen to her. So Saturday mornings at eight o'clock. Yes, ma'am. I'd be up, I'd be recording it, but you know, I'd be like, okay, hey girl. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alumna Primus. I appreciate that. All right. Well, introducing our next panelist for this afternoon is alumnus Monty Ross. All right. All right now. Alumnus Ross is the president of production of Solidify Productions. Solidify is a full feature film, stage, and TV investment and production company designed to promote a more inclusive narrative and in major media. Ross is also a producer and director. He was part of the vanguard that took the independent filmmaking industry by storm and presented new and engaging stories about the African-American experience that are known throughout the world. As a co-producer from the early 1980s through the 2000s, alumnus Ross's story, collaboration with Spike Lee, brought to a worldwide audience the following critically acclaimed films, Do the Right Thing, Malcolm X, School Days. How many of us are always talking about School Days at CAU? And Keep the Faith, Baby. The Life and Times of Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Alumnus Ross holds a bachelor's degree in social science and mass communications and film studies from Clark Atlanta University. Thank you so much, Alumnus Ross, for being a part of this panel and for continuing to serve your alma mater. We could not thank you enough. Well, all right. <laughs> I am uh, very happy to be here. And uh, I think I think everything is operational. Well, that's <laughs> am I no, good? No, thank We just, we know you are. You are great. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So going into your first question, um, mm -hmm. 
what type of technology or platforms does one need to work remotely if their interest is in film or production or you know any type of outside um, area within the arts of film? Yeah. Well, the one of the first things um, about one of the first things about our uh, our industry that we you know have to um, I think I'm on here. Right now. I'm, can everyone see me? Yes. Um, okay, cool. Okay, here. so one of the first things about our industry that you really have to understand is that it's compartmentalized into four major parts. The first part being development, the second part being pre-production, the next part being production, and then finally uh, post-production. And then after post-production, you get into marketing and promotion, and then you finally deliver the film to audiences worldwide sometimes, or sometimes you can deliver those audiences to very select groups um, that can be in all sorts of um, um, arenas, you know. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I always try to stress in terms of what our industry is right now, um, you can be in a development executive only and never even see production only because you have the expertise and skill in knowing how to put all the pieces and components together for a project. Mm -hmm. So if you do have that expertise, right, and you're very good at that expertise, that means uh, you can work for a major studio doing that. Um, we now are at a point in time, like when Spike and I started, you know, it was virtually no man's land. Whereas now, you know, it's, it's very filled with many high level black executives and they deliver and have delivered. I would say over the last, I would say over the last 37 years, as long as I've been doing this, we're now up to multi-billion dollars in terms of gross uh, sales when it comes to the African-American experience. And you combine all of that, not only in theatrical, but you also look at cable, you also look at, um, you also look at regular television, right? You look at DVD sales, you know? Redbox is still, you know, very viable. So when you look across the, yeah. the whole spectrum of our industry now, uh, we watch movies on our cell phone. Now we watch movies on our watch, you know. So wherever there is a platform, there is content. And so a uh, part of scheduling, schedule the big rocks is to begin to understand that one story can have its impact worldwide for a very long uh, period of time, you know. Mm -hmm. So to understand our industry and just think about um, a lot of times people have a tendency to still think of the arts as that, uh, no, don't, don't go towards the arts. No, don't, oh, no, but no, what you have to understand is the arts serve a very strategic interest for our culture, period. It provides the humanity. Mm -hmm. It provides us a way to think about, you know, what's going on. It provides us a way to see the conflict and then write about that conflict and then write movies about that conflict, have all kinds of documentaries about that conflict. And those images, those movies, that content can make an impact for a very, very long period of time. So how does technology play into that? Well, technology has advanced our industry threefold and it's even going to be into the future. Uh, Mark's comments were so excellent because technology is where you really have to be. And not necessarily just as an end user, you know, other words, you know, scrolling through your email, scrolling through Instagram. Okay, that's one part of the dynamic. Yeah. Everyone who can take um, social media right now and deliver, let's say, a wide audience, right, of 100,000 users. Well, if you're a filmmaker and you have a film and you have an audience, with 100,000 users, think about it. The, the person who connects you to that, all of a sudden now 10,000 people out of 100 may actually buy the product. They may actually rent the product and even more than that. So it gets really exciting because sometimes you can get down to 1,000 key critical people who really like what you do and will spend you know, a very good amount of money on a certain price point. Well, think about it. You start doing the math, you only need 100,000 people to spend $100. That's 100,000 a year plus. So 
one of the things about uh, my business that I love and I still get excited about, you know, is the fact that when you really get into digging between uh, the gravel and, and, and maybe you go to a, a shoot sometimes and it's a horrible shoot or maybe now that you can't go to a shoot and you're thinking, oh my God, what's going to happen? No, innovation about these big rocks in our business means that you sit there and you say, hmm, what if? Yeah. What if? What if? And that what if can lead you in so many different directions. And the thing that you have to understand about our, is our business is not like when I first started where we relied totally on film. Now we rely totally on digital technology. So what does that mean? In a green room called green screen, I can put up a big environment in there, give the actor directions and not have to be in the room. Sure. Now, if I have an actor or actress who's very passionate about what they do, you're like, oh my God, it's so heartfelt. Well, when they leave the room, they may go and sip some coffee or relax and you're like, wow, you know. But as far as the, as far as the content that they delivered and even the green room or the green screen where that information was that was, we were able to put in that room, all of those technicians now can work remotely and all through your laptop and even through your phone, because there's some very uh, astute young people who know how to take their smartphones and mm -hmm. literally create productions. There are some so, great apps out there that yeah. you can just utilize and create a whole video on your phone or music. Create a, create a, whole, <laughs> create a whole video. So um, just, you know, the key points here is to remember in the film and, and television business, we have four major components. That's development, that's pre-production, that's production, and then that's post-production. So um, there have been times in production where I've had to micromanage as a producer 300 people a day for 40 days, mm -hmm. uh, film all around the world. Okay. Uh, there have been times in post-production. Right now, if you're in post-production out there, you know, you're like, there's some people in post-production right now, James Wilcox, who's an alumni of Clark who is one of the top editors right now in the, in the business. Uh, I don't wanna say the project that he's working on, but I'm saying he, he's working right now, editing a very, very major client in our business. And it's gonna be a heck of a movie. And this is one of his Ouch. jobs. So I'm just basically <laughs> saying that in our business, creativity takes you a long way. And we have a long list of alumni from Clark um, who, when I, when I started, so I, I, I see the Brian Barbers of the world, you know, I, <laughs> man, this, this is, there's so many folks that I could, you know, just start name dropping who came out of, you know, those sacred halls, Dr. Eichelberger, uh, making sure like, okay, guys, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You know? <laughs> and uh, Dr. Eichelberger has seen us in all of our rare forms. He's seen all of our mistakes, but his encouragement and being at CAU propelled us to get out here and find a way to create in our business a way Definitely. to make an impact. So what are those big rocks? Hey, understand that in our business, those big rocks can have a lasting impact. And I, I am very happy to say that um, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X and um, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., two major icons um, in the 19th century that impacted our country. Um, I have had the pleasure of, of co-producing both of those films. And we are in the process now of doing more films that solidify production. Our film is out right now called One Angry Black Man. I'm not here to plug. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying that- well, Look, uh, look when, you, when you're ready to drop the trailer and the promo uh, and the montage, right. you, know, you know where to find us at, right? No I know, problem. I know what to, I know where to find you. At. All right, yeah. look, okay. look, don't forget about a small piece. <laughs> uh, you know, we'll be ready to promote in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, and we can't forget about Tyler. We can't forget about Tyler Perry. Tyler, Tyler catches a lot of flags, but one of the things, and even when Spike went in on Tyler, you know, I can publicly say that because I know Spike, and and you know, I've never met Mr. Perry, but one of the things I always appreciate about uh, Spike and I always appreciate about Tyler is the fact that not only do they embrace uh, the culture of, uh, that they came from that has gone on to make a significant impact. Uh, many of us would not have become executives in this business. Many of us would not have worked behind the scenes had it not been for Tyler and Spike.
pushing the ball forward. So a lot of times when those guys get to locking heads and talking about their images and things like that, man, I've, I've, man, I've sent emails to Spike, man, I wish I could talk to Tyler. And I'd be like, man, y'all don't understand <laughs> the amount of people who have had careers in this business so that they can become the lawyer, the entertainment lawyer that they want to become. They can become the cinematographer. They can become the casting director, largely because they have a significant output of movies and those movies are very profitable. So working behind the scenes, I'm always, you know, um, acknowledging, you know, that aspect of the business uh, because they push the ball forward so that, um, like I said, you can develop your career if working behind the scenes is something that you want to do. So hats off to Mr. Perry and of course hats off to my boy Spike. You know, and I could call him. And that hands off know. to Alumnus <laughs> Cross. You know, look, we got to toot your horn too now. Look, we yeah. got to toot your horn too because you are doing some great things out there. And you know what? When I get home, I'm pulling out my Malcolm X video <laughs> DVD because I had to, you know, I had to. Uh, Showtime! I had to convert it. I had to convert it from VHS to DVD. Now the Blu ray. Now it's just on the computer. So. <laughs> But I thank you so much, though. I mean, you have definitely dropped some gems today, and we are so thankful for your vision and your creative mindset. Shout out to the left brains all day. Um, <laughs> we cannot get enough for you, and we are definitely looking forward to what you have, um, you know, coming out in the um, in the future. So we can yeah. definitely be there for you and support you to the fullest. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And. Everybody that's um, in the chat or the Q&A, if you have any questions for Alumnus Ross, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now. We'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. Now, y'all see what time it is. That means it's getting juicy. So uh, that means uh, our last panel for today, last but never least, he's going to have to bring that fire. <laughs> so introducing our final panelist for this afternoon is Alumnus Dr. J. White. Born in Compton, California, alumnus White is a two-time graduate from Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia, earning his Bachelor of Arts in Psychology in 2005 and a Master's of Art in Community Counseling and Education in 2008. Alumnus White then enrolled at Howard University in Washington, D.C earning a Doctorate of Philosophy in Developmental Psychology in 2015. While at Howard University, alumnus White won research awards in 2013 and 14 and completed several publications. Alumnus White has amassed several years of clinical counseling, educational research, college student development, and program evaluation and experience at various institutions. As a community influencer and service are concerned, alumnus White is no stranger. While in undergraduate school at CAU, he was the national winner of the 2005 Mel Davis Award for the Most Outstanding God Right Director slash Community Service Award for Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, amassing thousands of hours mentoring and volunteering as an active member of his university's fraternity. Under Alumnus White's direction, CAU, Office of Residence Life and Student Development, successfully launched the university's first ever living learning communities where students focused on the holistic development of our students. Through this implementation, his de department has assisted increasing the university's efforts to retain our students. Now, without further ado, thank you so much, Alumnus White, for being a part of this panel and for definitely serving your alma mater always. We know we can always call on you, so thank you so much for being there, just like everybody on this panel. <laughs> thank you. Uh, greetings, faculty, staff, alum, friends, family, and esteemed panelists. Uh, I'm humbled to be here today. And I want to just give a special shout out to the Office of Alumni Relations at Clark Atlanta University. You guys do great work. You guys do really, really great work. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to serve our exceptional university. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um, now, just going into your first question. When people consider adaptive learning technologies, they may guesstate online courses or students working clickers to acknowledge uh, questions from an instructor. 
Is this the correct approach to think about them? Man, I would say no, but I want to I want to take a step back. Uh, receiving this question regarding uh, adaptive learning te uh, technologies, it was ironic because my dissertation actually focuses on effective educational strategies uh, to increase the transactions between the, uh, the the basic students and professors within the classroom. Yeah. So for me, it was like, oh my god, this is this is perfect, right? So I'm getting a little <laughs> geeky, right? Um, so what the research actually says is that uh, we find effective ways to increase those transactions, like classroom engagement what are uh, students uh, on the course content, then basically uh, it increases their, their ability to attain whatever the, uh, the course content is, right? So their trajectory as far as, uh, as, far as content uh, attainment is more steep. Rather like you have a, a regular, uh, I guess, upward trend, it'd be more steep if we're able to basically uh, engage our students, right? So when we talk about uh, adaptive learning technology, we have to just basically define it, right? It's basically a, 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 a what we say, a computer-based, uh, online educational system that modifies uh, the presentation of the materials uh, for the students uh, 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 basically uh, performance. So it modifies as a student like clicks and, and, and engages in, in, in that type of uh, in that type of technology, right? So it serves as a research, uh, a resource that provides the best possible way of learning uh, and is learn and this learning is basically customized for each student. Right. It helps to reinforce basically the, the, the course of material that's presented. But what happens is it's presented in multiple formats. Right. So students are able to basically consume this information in multiple ways. Of course, uh, with anything online, you can reach hundreds of thousands of people uh, all at once. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, this type of technology, it is aimed to emulate um, and support uh, uh, our instructors, but it's never there to replace the instructor. Uh, having instructors is, is wonderful. And, and on that note, when you talk about that, when you're able to couple great instruction that we receive at Clark Landing University, as well as great technology, we're able to prepare our, our students for the next generational changes, right? Um, and we have to understand that uh, uh, these adaptive learning uh, uh, technologies, right, will be the vehicle to reimagine uh, our 21st century and our 2020 century uh, learning within the United States, right? Yeah. So, still not done. I know, I know I'm, I'm going to go in, right? <laughs> oh, no, um, go, go all the way, go all the way in. We are learning today our, our thinking steps <laughs> on. <laughs> all right. So, when we think about all these different things, like, why is this, why does this even matter, right? It matters because you guys know that we have inequalities. That's why we have HBCUs, right? There are inequalities between Blacks and, 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 and our white counterparts period, point blank. When we talk about those inequalities, I'm going to talk about two very, very briefly, right? One is the, uh, the achievement gap. There's a huge achievement gap between African-American uh, students and, and our white counterparts, right? Empirical research actually supports the fact that African-American students have continued to struggle in uh, academic achievement as it pertains to standardized uh, tests. So our standardized tests, the ACT, the GRE, the 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 uh, the SAT. I think I said that twice, right? And any other uh, types of standardized tests. I mean, back in Los Angeles in middle school was like the CBS. I'm like, why are we taking this test? I have no idea. Like, why are we taking this test? Right. I heard you so it ITBS. I exactly that. right. Oh. I, I remember that too, right? And the key factors, and this is crazy because we have the, the the actual data to support this. The key factors to contribute most times to test performance mm -hmm. is your race you know, social economic status. So we talk about inequalities, right? We talk about Black Lives Matter, we talk about all these different things. We've been marching for a long time. It's time for all our alum, for all the persons that, that are actually on here to actually get the knowledge and do something with it, right? So what are we gonna do with this, right? So we know that that's the issue. We know that there are inequalities in, in, in education. We know that there are inequalities in the achievement gap, but that achievement gap is basically an inequality because we lack the resources. So the last thing I want to talk about uh, is uh, attainment. There's an attainment gap. When you talk about attainment, what are we talking about? Degree attainment, right? There are a greater number of African Americans, even Latino Americans, actually entering college, right? But there are a fewer amount of those individuals entering college to actually complete with their degrees compared to their white counterparts, right? Uh, also, it says that the, uh, the National Association of Scholars reported, this is in 2010, that the graduation rate for white students uh, that begun at a four-year institution was 62.6%, right? 62.6%. Uh, and that's compared to a modest 40.5% for African-American students. Mm -hmm. 
and that's a huge issue, right? So that's why we 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 need to have these adaptive uh, learning uh, strategies, right? And last thing I want to say is the reason why we've been talking about the achievement gap, the reason why we're talking about degree attainment, is because a lot of scholars have have believed that post secondary education and that and that degree attainment is our key chance. Uh, for upper mobility within the United States. So this is how we change our tax bracket, right? Um, and I think we all know that. <laughs> so the, the, the connection, like how do we make all this connect? Uh, CAU finds herself in a position to leverage incredible uh, and one of a kind instruction through our professors, but also they have the ability to leverage this type of technology that we're currently doing, right? So when we think about this, we can single-handedly change uh, our retention rates and our graduation rates, right? And this is similar to what the university just now did with COVID-19. Within a matter of days, uh, the university uh, had to equip a lot of students with Wi-Fi, uh, hotspots, uh, tablets, laptops, all right? We start leveraging uh, Canvas, Zoom, Blackboard, Collab. Uh, currently, right now, a lot of people may not know this, right? But the university is actually lever uh, leveraging uh, uh, adaptive learning uh, a software by Dr. Mintz and Dr. Plummer and colleagues uh, through one of their NSF grants. And basically what, what they're doing with that is they have this uh, adaptive learning software costs us hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and they're using that as well as they're coupling on that with uh, supplemental instruction. Uh, they're also training students to have uh, uh, self-efficacy, uh, growth mindset, as well as they're actually training staff and faculty as well, right? And they also offer STEM students uh, 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 earlier opportunities to be mentored and to receive uh, 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 research like experiences, right? Again, single-handedly changing uh, the retention and graduation rates of our students. And that is definitely good to know, only because you know, a lot of people do not know this information. Um, particularly our alums, you know, because we, we get a lot of questions, you know, asking, Where's the money going to, you know, where, what's happening with it? You know, what are our students learning? Are our students learning? So, I mean, just from you, you know, breaking that, those vital pieces down, you know, now we can know at least what some of it is going towards, you know, or how our students are benefiting from attending CAU. So, I mean, I hope in the future that we can have more conversations on this. So at least we can at least dive a little deeper to see exactly what our students are doing to prepare themselves for, you know, what's next after graduation, you know. We don't want to have that, well, CAU students aren't prepared or CAU alumni aren't prepared, you know. It's good to know that we are living in the digital world, we are thinking innovative, and we are pushing our students to, you know, learn what it is out there to learn to sustain themselves. So. Yes. Thank you so much for breaking that down and for bringing awareness to that. Um, we truly appreciate that, Dr. White. Of course. If you all have any questions for Alumnus White, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel right now. We'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session, which is approaching now. Do, do, do. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for our um, panelists today. We truly appreciate everything, all the gems that you all have dropped today. I mean, I definitely have my little notes down here that I've been taking. So you, know, you all probably have seen my head bobbling, you know, while people were talking because I was taking notes. Because <laughs> I mean, we all have learned something today, even our students, faculty, staff, alumni, friends, stakeholders, shareholders, whoever is on the call today. So I mean, we all learned something new. We're gonna give you guys a couple of seconds to go ahead and drop your questions into the Q&A uh, section of the Zoom control panel. And we'll go ahead and begin to take those questions now. Just a reminder though, if you do have any questions, please be sure to type them into the Q&A box of the Zoom control panel, okay? Now is the time to definitely engage with our alumni and to um, network. So let's check to see if we have a few questions. All right, we do, we have a lot of questions. All right, this one is actually um, for alumna Primus. Um, this is more so a um, congratulatory kudos. This is from alumnus Powell, Caprice Powell. 
He said, you mentioned a lot of great tools for goal setting and not limiting yourself. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see who else. And he said, my question is, when things get tough and one becomes discouraged, what helps her to keep going? So when things get tough, alumnus Primus, Primus and one becomes discouraged, what helps keep you going? Well, everyone becomes discouraged. And in these times, it's easy. And, you know, when the pandemic started, I had kind of made up my mind for the beginning of June. Mm -hmm. And then my office said, you know, July 7th. And we just got a note um, a few weeks ago saying, you know, not till the end of the year. So it was, it was, it's one of those things where you, you just have to change your mind. I mean, mm -hmm. I know it sounds simple. And I, I remember when people would say it to me and I would be like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. But <laughs> you have to change your mind. And, um, you know, I think the thing that I'm missing the most from um, the pandemic is that I do a, a hot yoga practice. And I have not been able to get into, you know, a hot yoga studio. But mm -hmm. I have a, a teacher, and she's not my favorite, but one of the things that she always says in class is, are you in control of your brain or is your brain in control of you? And so for me, especially as I got a little bit more mature, when my brain starts going down one of those paths of, you know, why, why me? Why didn't <laughs> she do what she, you know, I, I just kind of click it off. Yeah. I literally have to go, oh, we're not going there today. Um, sometimes I say, that's not my assignment. I don't have to think about that. Sometimes I just drop into a mantra, you know, thank you, God. Thank you, ancestors. Thank you, universe. <laughs> but you, ha I have to take firm control, you know, over my brain. And now to do that, that means you have to go to sleep on time. Mm -hmm. That means for me, I have to get about 3.2 miles a day. It's just walking, but I do a morning walk. I do an afternoon walk. But I do those things because they help me to discipline my brain. Sure. And, you know, I don't want to go so far where I'm crying uncontrollably because it takes yes. too long to get myself back. That's true. So I've just learned to take control of my brain. And, and don't get me wrong, sometimes I'll go like five or ten minutes before I realize I'm going down the rabbit hole but as soon as I realize it it's like you know let me grab my thoughts back, snap back. Yep. and put well, myself I mean, back into center mental health is, is good wealth so you know if, if you're not good up here everything is it's downhill exactly exactly you have one more follow-up question and then we're going to move on to alumnus Ross um he wanted to know uh alumnus Powell wanted to know I know she mentioned Twitter being a way she connects with people outside the U.S. Are there other ways to create those networks and connections? Yes. Social media makes it easy. But easy. I am a person that believes in travel, and that, that's one of the things I mentioned, no borders. You, we have been taught that America is the end all, the be all, and everything here is better than everywhere else. <laughs> and as soon as you step into another country, and realize, oh, this is better over here. You know, the first time I went to Paris, I was going into the metro and the trains were stopped. Now, I've lived in New York. When the train stopped, you just kind of sit there. That's true. You wait. I was in Paris, I grabbed my book, I sat down, and all of a sudden this little lady comes up to me and she's like, well, where are you trying to go? She's got a map and she's like, leave here, go around the corner, get on that train. That doesn't happen in the U.S. When stuff is shut down, it's shut down and you wait. <laughs> but if you never experience, you know, another country, you think we are the best because that's all you hear. Um, I was in Brazil in 2016 for the Olympics. In Brazil, on their public transit, between the hours of like 5.30 and 7, they have women-only cars women only cars. Hmm. I thought it was wonderful because you don't have to be bothered with guys and not that guys are bad, 
but you don't have to be bothered. You don't have to be bothered with a man with his legs spread wide and you can't get in the next seat. Or a man, you know, who has smoked and drank and he gets on there and he smells. It was a wonderful thing. If you were over 60 in Brazil, public transportation is free. But again, if you don't go anywhere, you know, you don't learn these things. So guys, you gotta go somewhere, get a passport. But I'm connected with international people on all of my social media platforms, um, LinkedIn, Twitter, and um, Facebook. Nice. I mean, it's LinkedIn is definitely uh, growing, growing. It's becoming like the hub definitely for connections. I mean, definitely for networking. And, and are we down for this COVID? Well, the first time I realized LinkedIn was a good thing, I reached out to this gentleman that I had found at a company that I had been calling on mm -hmm. to make a sale. And I asked him, I was like, look, this is what I'm selling. I don't know who I should talk to at your company. And this gentleman, he didn't know me, but he lowered his voice and he said, this is a real good time for you. They're actually reviewing that item right now and these are the two people you need to talk to so i know there's some people who poo poo linkedin because it's not sexy but if you are in yeah. business it's where you need to be that's your resume online <laughs> <laughs> check well thank you so much for that alumnus premise we really appreciate those um those gems again and if you can um in the uh Q&A section, if you can drop your social media handles so people can get in contact with you, we will greatly appreciate that. And for those that are still listening, what we'll do is we'll send it out on the post survey as well. So if you all would like to follow alumnus Primus, you can definitely do that. So next to our next question. Thank you so much, alumna Primus. We're going to go on over to alumnus Ross. This question is for you. You ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. Now. Ready. All right. All right. <laughs> I'm ready. The question is uh, for recent graduates, it is not easy identifying career fields based on their majors. What types of roles do you currently see and envision for the future in the film industry for non communication majors, i.e., business, sociology, or science majors? And this comes from alumna Sandra Brooks. Okay. So I, th I think her question is, what are some of the other career options? Yeah, what, what do you basically see uh, for people that do not have a major in um, communications or film, but people that have majors in other departments? Like, what do you see for them um, if they would like to venture into the career film industry, into the film industry career? Yeah, well, the first thing is learning how to network. I think everyone on the panel has really stressed the importance of networking. So you really have to, to network and get to know people. And one of the uh, other uh, key points is uh, development, that in development, that's where, um, that's where the deals are actually made because uh, what happens, let's say you are um, uh, Will Packard. Let's, let's say that you're, you know, those folks are gonna get the deal first. So they land the deal and once the deal is landed, now they started looking for support people. You know, who are the key people that other people are talking to because they rely on, you know, the other folks to fill in those gaps. So the more you are networking, the more you uh, learn who's who and who actually has a real deal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's when you, that's when you, that, that, that way you can afford, avoid that gravel, you know, but you can really get in there and find out who has the real deal. And then uh, do you make friends easy? Cause sometimes uh, some people can, you know, they're introverted, they're shy. And that's one of the things you got to get over your shyness. You know, you have to, you have to not necessarily have to come out all bold and blazing, but you definitely have to learn how to engage with people and problem solve. You know, as quiet as kept, our business is about problem solving, even though it's creative, it's problem solving. So if, if you're on the support team and you can help us solve problems, you can help us micromanage, you know, $35 million for the budget. Think about Ava DuVernay had a budget of $100 million, right? So she definitely needed to support people who understand the, the mechanics of that kind of budget, right? So in her inner circle, in her team, right, she has those go-to people. Well, uh, you know, Ava can be very quiet in and of herself, but if she has someone on her team um, who has a lot of skills that she may need, then she can refer uh, to that person. So 
our business is really based on those kinds of relationships. So if you're shy, reticent, you got to get over that and get out there and network and then begin to actually find out who has the real deal and see what place you can help on that team in mm -hmm. terms of solving a problem and then moving forward. And the more you're relying upon to solve problems, believe me, in our business, it's a small network and then other people want to work with you because they know that you have a very uh, specific expertise that helps move the ball forward. Hmm. Well, here's a follow-up question for you from um, alumna Sean Brannon. Um, and this is kind of, I guess you can kind of recap from what you were saying earlier uh, today in regards to um, the advice that you would give to students who may be in a major that is being eliminated by technology, which are a lot of our hands-on, you know, um, industries and also um, alumnus fields. You can also speak to this as well. Um, what advice would you give to alumni who want to change careers during this pandemic? The first advice is always research. Um, if you're spending, I know, I know when I was at Clark, I love HBCUs. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and one of the reasons I love it is because it's, it's, it's socially engaging. You can, you can always find things to do. But one of the things that we did while we were in school is um, we did a lot of research. And sometimes that research uh, was, was what we had to do for class, but also find yourself uh, actually going to certain uh, industries that you are uh, reticent about and finding out what they need. In other words, the next five years, right, with COVID-19, uh, COVID-19, we're going to get, and in, 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 in what's going to happen, we're going to acclimate ourselves to COVID-19. But here's the thing, like over the next five years, the next seven years, where do you want to be? Mm -hmm. And you got to define that goal first. Where do you actually want to be? What position do you actually want to play? And then, and this is the weirdest thing with some folks, what do you actually want to do? <laughs> so many people don't know what they want to do. And they're always running from that question. They run, they run, they run, right? And then 10 years after they graduated, still running, running, <laughs> running. Okay, set yourself down and figure out what you want to do. I can't tell you the amount of time and the amount of sacrifice I have made to learn to be a producer, right? And then learn to micromanage things. It's because after a while, I said, hey, look, if we're going to move the ball forward, we need to understand how to do this. And so me and Spike Lee sitting in one room said, hey, let's get this done and let's get this done in a way that's going to make an impact. And that's the same thing you have to do right now. Yeah. What do you want to do? Figure it out and then make the sacrifice. I know you want the better car. I know you want that three bedroom house. You see, I, I know you want all that. <laughs> I, I, I know and your parents are saying, I know all of those things. I know it. But I'm telling you, once you make the sacrifice about what you want, there's a lot of ramen noodles you're going to eat, even in grad school. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, saying, hyper, not hypertension <laughs> along the front. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just mainly, I'm just mainly saying that like once you're on that path and you make a sacrifice toward what you want, want, eventually the universe will open up and you'll have a path towards your goals. And if you trust and believe in that, uh, there'll be little signs away. And then the next thing you know, a big window opens up, a big door of opportunity opens up, and you'll look back and say, man, I'm glad I took the time to make the actual sacrifice toward that goal. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, Alumnus Fields, can you also speak to the question? Well, absolutely. You want to try to find what your passion is. I know that goes back to what Alumnus Ross was talking about. We don't know what we want to do, but you have to find out what your passion is and reach out to, uh, you have a lot of networks that you just don't know about. You have to come out of your shell as far as being an introvert. You have to contact the university with, I mean, it may be 10 or 15 years that you haven't been there, but contact and find out what type of classes they may be offering. You have to go back and reinvent yourself. And I know sometimes that may be overwhelming, but we have to always continue to invent ourselves and reach out to the networks of people and find out what can I do to improve my situation if my job is being uh, 
terminated or uh, they're going away from they're going towards the model of technology yeah thank you i mean and that's definitely something to think about like because we at this point in time we don't know we don't know right now um i forgot to tell you alumnus ross and alumnus fields please drop your contact information in the q a um, session so people can be able to um you know reach reach out to you on social media you know either it's your linkedin instagram facebook whichever one you prefer or gmail you know well email whichever okay so they can do um be able to get in contact with you and though for those that are listening we will also ensure that their contact information along with dr white is um in the uh, post survey so we're going to take one more question and then the rest of the questions we're going to answer them and um send them out to you all via the post survey because we are we are out of time so awesome 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 last question is for dr way this question comes from alumna nadi i'm sorry if i said it wrong fit fender <laughs> fender hillman her question states how can HBCUs prepare for the next five years of shifting priorities in the academic arena? What are the major challenges that HBCUs and particularly CAU must address to be prepared for the future? Thank you for that question. Um, how can we start this, right? First, you have to have stable leadership, right? You gotta have someone at the helm of Clark Landon University or any HBCU that knows how to direct, um, that has influence within the local and even on a federal level, and that's charismatic, and that is Dr. French. Um, I would also say that you need to have a, a, a more stable, uh, what would we say, um, we need to be more financially stable, right? Increasing our endowment. That means the alum, like myself and everyone else on this call, should give back. Um, that's one of the main things that we're, we're always in the teens as far as uh, when we talk about the HBC ratings, that's because our alum, they don't give back. We could easily catapult up into five, four, even three if our alum would just give back, right? As well as we, uh, as the institutional institutional advancement, you know, they need to get out of here and they need to knock on some doors and do whatever they need to do to, to, to get money as well. So financial stability, branding, right? This is the first year since I attended Clark Lennon University uh, in 2001 to 2020 this is the first year that I've actually seen uh, uh, basically intentional branding of the Clark Atlanta University brand, right? So, and that came in a lot of forms and fashions and, and, and phases, um, but branding is, is, is wonderful. Um, the next thing I would say, and it kind of goes back, uh, Fenda, to another question, what are the things that, that, that we can do um, when we don't have enough resources? There's things that we can do as far as just recruiting uh, passionate faculty and staff members, right? Because when we talk about uh, anything with, within the classroom and increasing that, uh, those transactions with students, first it starts with TSRQ, teacher-student relationship quality. Do the teachers or do the professors care about our students? Or are they, they, they just here, right? And I would say when I, when I was in my major, uh, uh, if it was counseling or if it was psychology, my professors cared and they cared even after I graduated and they still reached out to me, right? And that's just an HBCU thing, because the same thing at Howard University, I have a resource mentor, Dr. Boykin, that always reaches out to me as well, right? Also, you want to increase student mattering, right, and student engagement. Student mattering basically means that if a student arrives to campus, does that student feel like he or she has a voice, right? That's very, very fundamental. And that's how we're going to continue to, to, to recruit, right? And we need to also, like I said, I don't know if I said this, but recruit people that are passionate. Like people, so I'm passionate, everybody on this panel is passionate because we are all alum, but if someone is not alum of Clark Lane University, they should still have that same amount of passion that they just want to give and serve, right? But I think the primary thing that we need to focus on uh, is our financial stability. It's, it's because of the CARES Act that uh, Clark Lane University is still in, in good standing in the sense that we didn't furlough any uh, employees, right? But you know that Morehouse, maybe you don't know, but Morehouse furloughed employees and let employees go. But then they got this huge grant for, for scholarships from Netflix. So it paints a different picture for the outside world, but that's where we need to get in here and do a better job of branding because our financial, I guess, uh, uh, stability is very, very stable at this point in time, given that we even gave back millions of dollars to students, 
some some of those same schools that received money did not give back as much money as Clark Atlanta did, right? And it's really, really because uh, our leadership, they care about our students. Uh, we're trying to do right by our students. Uh, but again, to answer those particular questions, that's that's pretty much my, my insight to that. Um, yeah. And we definitely, I mean, I, I can definitely attest that CAU is, is moving in the right direction um, to what you were saying. You know, we do care about our students. Um, there are some, you know, weeds that you, you know, you always have to pluck every now and then, but at the end of the day, we are getting there. And um, I do honestly believe that although Morehouse and Spelman did receive a large substantial amount of money, we'll get our money too, you know, because people will begin to see that CAU is also here too, and we're thriving, you know, very well. We have yet to furlough anyone we are doing good successfully. You know, our students are, are getting some remarkable jobs and scholarships and fellowships all over the world. And our alumni are doing outstanding things. You know, and I, I really feel and believe that's why, like you stated, branding is important. Because when we brand our school in a positive light, people are going to, you know, they're going to see that. Our social influencers, they're going to see that our stakeholders and shareholders, they are going to see that. And they're going to take heed and notice that, hey, you know what the U stands for? That's us, player. That's us. So, yeah, I had to throw that in. I'm sorry, y'all. That's that 2010, you know, conversation coming out. <laughs> but um, for anyone that, um, that listed questions in the Q&A box. We will definitely have those answered for you all by tomorrow and we'll send them out along with our post survey. So please do not think that your question has been overlooked because it has not. Um, we just ran out of time. No, this was such an awesome, such an awesome, awesome um, webinar today. A lot of great gems have been dropped and we definitely are truly appreciative for our alumni that are on this webinar, that are on this panel, that are operating this panel, and um, that is uh, serving our Office of Alumni Relations. Without you, there would definitely be no CAU, so just know that. Um, thank you again for all the questions. Please stay in contact with your alumni and look out for our upcoming webinars, which will take place every Thursday from noon until 1 p.m. and sometimes 1.21 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately following this webinar, you will receive a post survey. So please let us know what you think about today. Your feedback is truly appreciated. So guys, as we wrap up, once again, thank you all for um, being on the panel today, for definitely uh, coming out to service our webinar and for providing such excellent questions. Special thanks to my colleagues, Senior Director of Alumni Relations, Mrs. Gaylene e. Gatewood Joshua, and to Dr. Michelle Rhodes for their stellar service and to our panels for a remarkable job today. Thank you again for joining us. To everyone that is on the webinar, your questions were great, you were great, and we appreciate you for coming out today. We hope to see you next Thursday at noon for our June 25th webinar. <laughs>